So we are the Transform in the Trent Valley Landscape Partnership Scheme. We are funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund for a five year scheme and we're just coming to the end of our second year. So almost half of our scheme so far has been impacted by the pandemic, which has made life a little interesting, I'll be honest. Um, you can see our scheme area here in purple. So we are very focused on the River Trent, the floodplains and its tributaries as well, which is why it's such a long and thin shape there. So we pick up the Trent in Staffordshire near Rugeley, we follow it through to Orwas, up through Burton on Trent and then into Derbyshire. And we also take in sections of the River Tame from Tamworth and the River Dove from Utoxeter as well. The scheme is led by Staffordshire Wildlife Trust. They hold the grant, they are the lead organisation for this scheme, uh, but it is a partnership scheme. So there are 18 different organisations involved in this scheme in total, uh, and that's made up of different charities. So uh, Derbyshire Wildlife Trust is a partner, uh, Support Staffordshire, who I'm employed by, um, people like Canal and Rivers Trust and others as well. There's also local authorities uh, such as East Staffordshire Borough Council and also some industries uh, and businesses. So Tarmac and Aggregate Industries are also partners in the scheme. So it's a lot of different organisations who have this shared vision and shared goals for the area. Some of those organisations are delivery partners. They have a, a responsibility to deliver a, a part of the scheme, a project as part of the scheme, and some of them are supporting partners. Um, so they don't deliver anything specifically, but they sit on the board and they give guidance and support to the scheme as well. So there are 16 different projects which make up the scheme in total, and these fit broadly under three different themes. So the first theme is connecting communities through action. So this is all about engaging the residents and visitors to the area to engage with the projects and the activities that we put on. So this is through things like volunteering, lots of different volunteering opportunities we have. Um, through our wild child projects, so children and family activities outdoors, engage with nature that way, uh, school engagement, uh, adult training courses and wellbeing courses for adults as well. Uh, the second theme is River Valley Connections, uh, and this is all about access to the landscape as well. So access into and across the landscape, uh, such as circular walks, improving towpaths, uh, creating a long distance footpath along the River Trent called the Trent Valley Way. Uh, but it's also looking at things like interpretation boards um, and online website information as well to give people a bit of information uh, and understanding of that landscape. And our third theme is transforming the landscape. So this uh, theme has some larger scale projects in it. So those which are looking at um, restoring some of the habitats, the biodiversity, the floodplain, uh, things like uh, restoring old river channels and river islands as well. And this, this final theme also includes our cultural heritage projects. So they are looking at the built heritage of the area um, surveying it, looking at the condition of it, and trying to understand how that has shaped the landscape as well. So, as we do have almost 200 people on the call, I do want to give a little quick plug to our, our future talks. So you can see we've got a range of talks coming up, um, booked up and through until May, that we run them every other week, and you can book onto all of these through Eventbrite in the same way that you booked onto this one as well. So, that is enough from me. You're not here to hear from me. You're here to hear from George uh, about beavers. So I will hand over straight to George now. So George is employed by Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. He's a living landscape officer for the Trent Valley and he manages the Willington Nature Reserve, which is where this beaver project is taking place. So George, if you are there, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for now and I'll hand straight over to you. Hello. Am I there? <laughs> Hi, George. Uh, can you see me now? I can't see I can myself. See you absolutely. Cracking. Yeah. Awesome. Right. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, so let me just share my screen. Oh, could you just allow screen sharing, please? Oh, my apologies. It's turned off for some reason. Try that. There we go. That's better. Lovely. Thank you. Right. So. I'm George Bird, and I am the Living Landscapes Officer for the Trent Valley area, the Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. 
So part of my role is to look after 11 nature reserves in the Trent Valley area. Um, I don't, just on, don't do this on my own. I do it with a team of volunteers who do a lot more work than I do. Um, so it's a great team to have with us. Um, and one of the most exciting things I've been doing recently is working on the Beaver Reintroduction Programme at Willington Wetlands Nature Reserve. Um, so I'll give you a bit of an overview about the reserve um, and then why we want beavers on the reserve. It's going to be less about sort of the, the biology of a beaver and more about what the beaver is going to do at Willington. So, oh. there we go. So this is our reserve at Willington Wetlands. We've got two um, parcels of land. We've got the main large one on the left, um, which is 47 hectares. And we've got the smaller one on the right. Uh, we recently purchased this one, which was last year. Um, but as you can see, there's a big gap in the middle there. Um, so obviously what we like to do is to acquire that land in the middle. It's great for wildlife. There's ponds, there's ditches. It's uh, another extension of the wetland eventually. So that's what we really like. So if you look at the, um, the map on the right hand side, the, the, uh, the list there, it tells you sort of habitat types we've got on reserve. So at, um, at the reserve, it's, uh, it's great really. It is a, a real mosaic of habitats. So it means we've got a lot of different habitat types on there, which means it's great for a wide range of birds, mammals, invertebrates, um, and everything else on there. So we are situated in Derbyshire. It's close to the River Trent. As you can see um, on the bottom of that map, you can see the Trent meandering around there. Um, and it's important water storage area as well. So it's, it's great for wildlife. But in times of flood, this, this bit of land holds a lot of water. It's, it's really quite incredible to see it all submerged. It's, uh, it's a great site. So this helps to mitigate the effects of flooding downstream, whilst also providing a great space for wildlife. So one of the most important habitats we've got here is reed bed. Um, so we are quite lucky that we've got one of the largest single blocks of reed bed in Derbyshire. So on our reserve, we've got over eight hectares of reed bed. Um, and they're, they're home to a variety of birds and mammals. Um, so quite exciting thing we've got here, um, which I would be very impressed if any, any of you could spot it. Um, right in the middle of there, there's quite an important rare bird. Um, even if you know where it is, it's very hard to spot, but it's smack bang in the middle, you can see my cursor. It's right in the middle there. Um, and this footage was taken um, from our monitoring program that we're currently doing to monitor the beavers. So just to give you an idea, it is a bittern. Um, it's amazing. It's, it's great to see. And it's, it's very rare to spot these. So the most chance you've got of spotting them is if it's flying from one area of reed bed to the other. Um, so you've got to get really, really lucky to see one of these. So that's, that's our camera trap footage that we've had volunteers setting up for us. So not only is it great for things like bittern, um, we've got water rails that like to go on the edges of these. Uh, the, the kingfishers fly up and down the channels with them there. We have all, all sorts of warblers that, that utilize the reed beds for, for perching and for feeding. So the next, uh, next bit of habitat we've got is the wet grassland. So we have two, two large areas of wet grassland. And what, what these do is um, when the Trent floods, um, they're actually designed to flood. So when the gravel extraction site was restored back to nature, the profile of these was designed so that when, when the reserve floods, it releases the water slowly back to the Trent. Um, and this is deliberate because what we want at Willington is to store the water as long as possible before allowing it to get back into the Trent. And what this should hopefully do is help to prevent flooding further downstream. So within these meadows, um, it supports a range of plant species, which are great for things like butterflies um, and a range of other invertebrates. So in here, we've got a bush, bush cricket on the left. Uh, we've got a hoverfly on the right. Um, but also we have quite a lot of foxes on reserve. Um, so it's quite nice to see these. Uh, we've got plenty of camera trap footage of these um, and they'll go through the meadows looking for, for things to hunt, things to eat. So the meadows also provide great nesting grounds for birds um, in the summer. So we have things like lapwing in there um, and it's also a great feeding area for other birds such as curlew and snipe. Um, it's, uh, it's a great spot and at the moment we've, I think we've got about 12 curlew in the area at the moment um, and it's, it, it's a good place to see them if you want to, to come and look. So the next bit we talk about is the open water and the margins. So we have very large areas of open water on reserve and we've also got smaller ponds and ditches. Um, some of these are wet year round, so it's great for your fish, for your invertebrates and stuff. And others dry out in the summer. So what, what's good about these ones that dry out in the summer is that it's good for newts. So if you do get any fish into these smaller ponds, when it gets to the summer, they'll dry out and the fish will die, which means that the, um, your, your, uh, 
your newts and things like that, their eggs have a better chance of surviving to, to hatch into, into your larval forms and then grow into your adults. Um, so these, these ponds, these seasonal wet ponds are great. So if you look from our main track, you can't see these ponds. They are in the woodlands at the back. Um, and I've been through there recently, the last couple of weeks, and there's so many small ponds and it's great to see. Um, and also we've had, a, we had ecologists on site and they found uh, a range of newts, including great crested newts, which is always great to, great to spot. So the vegetation in these ponds and around the edges, it provides great places for dragonflies to lay their eggs. So they can either lay their eggs on or above water um, and they'll inject their eggs into the stems of the plants um, and also lay under the eggs. Um, but as I said earlier, these margins provide great foraging habitat for other birds. So we have water rails on reserve. Again, they're, they're quite difficult to spot. Um, so the best thing to do is listen out for them. And if you hear what you can describe as being a piglet squealing, chances are you'll have, have a water rail in there. Um, and it's a great, a great place for water rail. Um, we're also fortunate to have great white egrets and little egrets. So they'll feed around the edges and in the shallows looking for, for their prey. And we also have a range of other wader species on reserve. Um, another great spot to get at Willington is kingfishers. Um, so I forgot to show you the picture. So obviously we've got dragonflies. That's a water rail right there on the bottom left. Um, really good looking birds. And um, again, if you sit on our platforms and wait for them, you can see them running on across from reed bed to reed bed. Um, there's your kingfisher. And I'd like to say now all these pictures that you're going to see in these slides are either taken from, from Willington or taken to our trip to Devon to see the beavers. Um, but all these are, are from Willington. Um, so yeah, the, the, you've got a really good op uh, opportunity to spot kingfisher on reserve if you sit at platform two and three. They like to fly throughout the reed beds and they'll land on these little perches on the edge and you can watch the heads sitting perfectly still as they look for fish and then dive down to grab them. So another really exciting thing that we're getting at the moment is otters. So again, these pictures are taken from Willington on our, um, our camera traps that we set out to monitor our beaver project. Um, so you can see on top, we've got a adult female and one of their young. And on the bottom, we've got an adult male. And we know the difference because the ad between the adults, because the male's got a really distinctive kink in its tail and is a lot larger than the female and the young as well. So we're really excited to see these. Uh, a bit more difficult to see these are. So if you do, if you do want to spot one, you, you've got to get really lucky to see them at Willington. But if you do sit around for a while and you might see some, uh, some of your ghouls flying around, sort of mo uh, mobbing the water, and um, chances are there could be an otter in there. So keep your eye out. It's really exciting to see. The next bit of uh, habitat I can explain is the, the woodland on site. So we've got two main large distinct areas of woodland at Willington. We've got a large semi-natural broadleaf wet woodland. So that's the woodland on the right. You can see it's a bit darker green. Um, it's mainly, mainly dominated by willow. And what's great about this area is that there's loads of fallen trees, there's loads of standing dead wood. So it's trees that are dead, but they're still standing up. And there's loads of cracks and crevices in these trees. Um, so they could potentially be providing great habitat for your bats and your birds. Uh, we know we've got willow on reserve, um, so they could be utilising this dead wood in these in these woodlands um, as a place to to stop over and to, to nest in year to year. Um, we know we've got green woodpecker in the back of these woodlands too. Um, they've been spotted um, going in and out of the trees as well, so it's it's really really nice spot. And on the right hand side, the more light green, we've got the uh, um, the broadleaf plantation woodland. Um, so this is very dense. It's it's very limited. It's got very limited ground flora in here. Uh, what it was, it was planted, but it was never thinned out selectively. Um, so it, it's great for trees, but it's very limited on the ground flora in there. Um, so we'll get onto it more, but we're hoping that the beavers might have a real impact in this area. And I'll show you some pictures later to show what they could potentially be doing. And within these. Uh, woodlands. Um, between the wet and the dry woodland, we've got some really extensive, very much active badger sets. So we, every time we put a camera trap out, you guarantee that we'll get a badger on camera. There's loads of snuffle marks where they've been uh, searching for, for the food. The badger sets, they are, the holes on the badger sets are massive. It's, it's great to see. Um, and we'll be, we will be sharing more footage and more pictures of these with you at some point. Um, these are a couple of images we uh, took from the camera trap footage. Um, they're very inquisitive. The cameras do make a bit of a noise when they go off and start recording. So you'll see a badger run past, it'll click, it'll turn its head around, have a bit of a sniff. Um, and on the right hand picture, you can see how there's a bit of a, a faded mark on the left hand side of the screen. And that's where 
Badger's been really inquisitive and he's uh, come up to it and tried to sniff it. And uh, we've got a lot of footage where we can't see anything because they've been licking the cameras and it just blurs it out completely. But it's really, really cool to see. So that's sort of the, the main habitats we've got. We can break them down a lot further into different categories. That's, that's just a really easy way to, to distinguish what, is, what we have got on reserve. Um, so how we do, how we manage this is we try to mimic uh, Willington and across the Trent Valley is to try to mimic these natural processes which would have once occurred in the Trent Valley um, before we started fencing it very off and in the case of badgers, uh, beavers, sorry, started to cool them. So we spend a lot of staff and volunteer hours on reserve managing willow. Um, so we remove this from pond edges, um, from within weed, bed, weed beds. Um, and this is all to mimic sort of the natural browsing that would occur from large roving herbivores. Um, so years and years and years ago, you would have had roving herbivores traveling across the land and grazing and feeding. And because it was more natural, these areas would start to scrub up and then the cattle come back in and graze it down again. Um, but at the moment, because we've only got small pockets of these little wetland sites, we need to we need to keep on top of maintaining them. Um, so yeah, the removing of willow that mimics lateral herbivores, like I said, but also also beavers. So we do currently graze the reserve. So as opposed to some areas where you'll see there's really tight, tightly grazed grass, um, we use sheep and cattle, but we're using really low, de low densities um, to maintain the two large areas of wet meadow. Um, and what we get, we like to get a, like a variety of, of flowering plants in there, the sedges and rushes and your grasses. And like I said earlier, it provides great nesting habitat and breeding grounds for, for your birds, such as lapwing. So although we do, our, do do our best to mimic natural processes and some years the reserve floods, so we can't physically get into the reed beds. So you have a year without any management and then the reed beds get taken over with willow again. Um, we feel that the way forward at Willington is to let natural managers take over again. Um, so the reintroduction of beavers on site, that is a really big deal for us. They're going to ma manage the land a lot better than we can. And it means that we can then use our staff time and our amazing volunteer time to do other projects in the Trent Valley. So it's very volunteer intensive at the moment. So we'd like to reduce that, which is why we're trying to think more natural and, and bring these uh, wonderful creatures back in again. Yeah, so sorry, as I said earlier, more natural management. We'd also like to increase the size and connectivity in the landscape. So Willington is sat right next to an active quarry, which is owned by Semex currently. Um, and they're very good when they do restoration after extraction. Um, they have strict plans to follow to re reverse it back to nature. Um, and so what we're doing, we're working with them on, on how, to, how to restore their land. And then we are looking to hopefully take over their parcels of the land bit by bit as their extraction moves on. Um, so what this will mean is the Willington Reserve in the Trent Valley will just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so we'll be able to extensively graze it. Hopefully one day beavers will be allowed to be natural again, native um, for wild releases. Um, they might stick around at Willington. They might decide they want to go further up, up the streams to smaller areas where it's a lot quieter. Um, but just making it bigger and better, that's, that's our goal for Willington. So as a trust, um, we are wanting to lead and helping to lead the way for reintroductions in the Midlands. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but Nottingham Wildlife Trust are also planning a beaver reintroduction. Um, I'm not sure if I should have said that or not, but it's, it's great that two Midlands trusts are looking to release beavers. Um, we're very limited in, in the area for what we have got. Uh, Devon, Essex, all that sort of area, they have a lot of releases going on. Um, some of them obviously are under the radar and they've been caught. Um, and that's great because they're being recognized as being important and they're doing studies on that there is a lot of captive releases as well and um, so but that is in the south and that is in scotland so in the midlands we're really lacking so having two trusts wanting to release beavers to monitor them and to, to really understand what they do is really important so hopefully we're working very closely on the monitoring plan for their re reintroduction and our re reintroduction um, to really drive the evidence uh, to get beavers elsewhere so when we were trying to decide on a beaver release, we had to decide on a release site. Um, so as I said earlier, Willington's got a real mosaic of habitats. It's very diverse. There's lots of different areas. Um, so this is a drone image that was taken by our volunteers. Um, so 
the Beaver project is very heavily reliant on volunteers. They've done so much for us so far, and they have a broad, um, a wide depth of knowledge. Um, so they're teaching me stuff about habitat mapping with drones, with camera trap techniques, with um, with your research side of it. Um, so as you can see from this habitat map, we've got the two areas of, of wet grassland around the big areas of pond. Um, you've got the reed beds on the bottom and in the middle of the screen, just above the water, um, and the woodlands at the top. So your woodlands, they're going to provide a source of food for the beavers. So the beavers won't eat eat wood, they'll eat the bark and they'll eat the shoots and they'll eat the leaves. They don't actually eat the wood inside the tree. Um, so there'll be bark stripping um, and they can do this to either just take the bark from the bottom or to fell the tree. They'll gnaw into the wood and fell the tree so they can reach those nice sugary rich shoots at the top and they'll go up the tree and strip the bark off there and eat it. Um, but also obviously use this material for dams and to build their lodges. Um, so woodlands are very important. The grasslands, they sort of provide a source of food. Um, so your grasses, your flowering plants. Um, what they can do is they can roll this up into a ball. So they'll gather the plants and grasses, roll them into a ball and sit there and chew on it. It's, it's really cool. It's really cool what they do. So it's good to see. Um, and then obviously around the edges of the grassland, you'll be getting scrub encroachment. So your willow and things like that. And they'll help to keep on top of that. So then you've got your reed beds. Um, the new reed shoots when in the spring they come up, they're really sugary. So they're great for beavers to feed on. And, and by feeding on the reed beds, they help to keep it in a sort of a, a rotation. So if you don't cut reed beds back or you just leave them to grow year on year on year, eventually all the dead matter falls to the floor. It, it dries the reed beds out, um, which is quite tricky to manage at Wellington because it's a big reed bed, but it's too small to have big commercial vehicles coming in and out to cut the reeds and it's too small to get strimmers in there. Um, so although beavers aren't going to be the solution to this, they will help massively with keeping the, the reed beds in a, a good state and keeping the, the age of the reed beds uh, mixed. But also in the reed beds, a big issue we have is willow growing in there. Um, so we're currently cutting willow back. We're not treating it, we're not killing it. We're just cutting it and coppicing it because that's what would happen naturally. You wouldn't have pesticides coming in naturally um, not pesticides, sorry, we wouldn't have herbicides naturally applying to the reed beds, so we don't use herbicides. We, we cut it, it coppices if we cut it again. It's all on big rotation, and that's what beavers will hopefully do for us in there. And if they don't do as much as we like them to do, we can get in there and help them as well. Um, and then you've got your open water. So the reason beavers build dams mainly is to create deep pools of water. So back before we unfortunately eradicated them and before we started uh, taking over the landscapes they would have been predated by large wildcats um there is one wildcat and i can't remember which one it is now which would have been in the uk and it's the only wildcat that could have dived down and got the beavers from the bottom of the ponds so they create the dams create this deep water so they see a predator they'll dive down and out the way because most of your big cats wouldn't have been able to dive down and get them so obviously beavers don't know the wildcats aren't here anymore so they're still inbuilt to build these dams um, but by building these dams, obviously, they create habitat for themselves, they get uh, marginal vegetation around the edges, which they feed on. So the open water here, it's going to create a real nice, comfy environment for them. They're going to be happy to, to swim down there and get away. And also, if, if, they do, if you're lucky to see one, you make a bit of a disturbance, they can escape from you too. So the margins of these ponds, you can see on the edges, you can see some trees growing on there. Um, so this is like the ditches as well. They'll, uh, they'll go up and down these ditches and chew off the, the wood and the, the food on the edges and maintain these in a good condition. And also we've got the Eggington Brook Whitlands through the middle. Um, so we've got a nice flowing water source. So if they do want to start damming and redirecting it, then they're more than welcome to, because it'll create a more natural habitat for them. So that's, that's why we chose Willington. So it's got plentiful food source. It's got all the open water they need and protection. It's just a perfect reserve. And we do know it, it, it floods extensively. And beavers are quite happy to cope with this. They'll create dams, um, they'll create their lodges, sorry, this is where they stay, and they can create multi-story lodges. So if they build, build a lodge and it starts to flood, they'll build one on top of it and make multi-levels to escape the flood waters. But we've got plenty of dry spots on reserve for them anyway, so there'll be plenty of areas that don't get flooded completely. So why do you want beavers? I've explained really about why why we want them for a more natural approach. Um, but we can split it down to a couple of parts to make it a bit easier. So one of them is the impact on, on nature restoration and the other is the nature-based solutions that they can provide for us. So beavers are a keystone species. So their effects on their surrounding natural environment is really big 
compared to their abundance and size. Um, so if you think about this picture here, a family of beavers have created this. So they've, you can see the deadwood in the middle, this is the ponds where it's flooded. This would have been a trickling stream at one point, but they've created this. So if you think about how big a beaver is in comparison to that picture, they're about the size of a, a small, small Labrador. That is a really big impact that they've had. Um, and because of this, we call them ecosystem engineers. They make what they want. They know what habitat they like and they make it. Um, but this in turn benefits such a big variety of species as well. Um, so you've got your invertebrates, you've got your birds, you've got your mammals. It's, it's quite incredible. When we went to see this picture, this is from Devon, no matter what activity at night was is cracking in here, the bats flying around the ponds, feeding off the insects. It's just, it's really cool. So with the regressing of the area, it creates more diverse habitat. So you can find that aquatic plants start to spread throughout the ponds. Um, and they also create a series of canals. So they can connect these ponds up by excavating the dirt and running through it. And you can link these ponds up. So as, as they're feeding in one area, they might go down the canal to another area. And by this, they're transplanting the plant materials to spread these aquatic plants into the area. Um, so it makes it more diverse, essentially. Um, and then the increase in vegetation cover then benefits a range of other wildlife, such as dragonflies, butterflies. You've got your frogs, toes and newts that will lay eggs on this vegetation too. So by creating dams, they will also uh, trap silt. Um, so they are leaky. And I'll show you this one here. So this is Paul. He's our grazing for nature manager. Um, so I did ask him to pose for me because he wanted to see the exact size of it. Now, what's different to our site with this site is this is on like sort of a small valley. So it is a big decrease in height from the top to the bottom, whereas Willington's fairly flat. So although we all get big, we might get big dams, chances are they won't be quite this size. Um, but we don't know because some of the channels are quite deep, so they could do this. Um, but what that does is behind this dam, it will trap silt. And what this does, it promotes vegetation growth on the trap side. But also from downstream, you can see where Paul is now. You can see it's quite rocky um, and quite gravelly. And this is quite a small stream. So by trapping the silt, you're stopping the silt washing down and covering up these gravel beds. Um, and these gravel beds are vital for fish spawning and for feeding grounds. Um, so it, it does a good job further downstream. And a lot of people are, uh, are concerned about the impacts on fish. Um, but the majority of studies are positive in the um, relationship with beavers and fish. So they do more good than harm. And in, um, in Europe, common lizards have also been found to sit on these dams, which you wouldn't really expect them to be in a wetland area like this, on the top of a dam next to water. Um, but they'll sit on these dams and wait for their prey to come in. Uh, and then when, as soon as the predator comes in, they'll just dive into the water and they'll get away and then come back again later. So it's really quite amazing what can come back um, into the area um, once you release beavers. And also these lodges that they create, um, they can be shared by other, other species such as voles. They'll happily sit in the, in the lodge walls, create their own little burrows, and it's nice and protected for them, nice and safe. And they'll leave, even go into the holes and shelter and feed. So it's really, really interesting what, what lives alongside of a beaver in their lodges, which is their homes. So they, uh, like I said earlier, they do take the bark off trees. Um, they don't eat the inside of the trees, or you can see them gnawing on the trees. It's, it's to get the tree down to feed off it. So on the left hand side, you can see we've got um, a tree where they've given up on. Um, so they've ring blocked this tree. So all the bark around the edge is now gone. Uh, and by doing this, it creates standing deadwood. So that tree now will die if it's been gnawed enough. Um, and what that'll do is create deadwood. Um, so on this deadwood, you have things called saprosylic invertebrates and they like to feed off the deadwood or feed off what's living on the deadwood as well. So these beetles and invertebrates will then in turn provide food source for birds and bats um, but not only this, the bats and the birds will actually live in these trees. Once they're rotted enough and there's holes being formed, they'll start to start to roost in there, start to nest in there. So it, it, it's really great. And so in the middle, um, you can see they've cut straight through it. And again, these pictures are from Devon. So these are all our own pictures that we've taken. It, it was an amazing trip. So if you can ever get out to see, see them or come to Wellington eventually, it, it's very impressive what they do. So that plantation one that I showed you earlier, um, it's very dense. And like I said, there's not much light going to the floor. But you can see in these pictures, there's lots of vegetation on the ground. It, it's, it's mainly grass at the moment, as you can see, um, but it's green. Whereas in, uh, at Willington, if you look at this picture, it, it's brown. There's, there's nothing on the ground. It's just dense wood and, um, and it, it's, it's great for trees. <laughs> and they're all a uniform age. There's not much going on in there. But if the beavers were to come in and do what they did in this picture, you'd be opening up the light to come back down to the canopy, uh, up to the forest floor 
and it'd be great to see what comes back. We might be getting more grasses and things like that back. And eventually, if it's a really nice woodland with lots of vegetation on the floor, we could start to reintroduce cattle grazing within these woodlands. And then there'll be rubber up against trees, knocking trees over, feeding from them and keeping it in a natural state. So we're thinking about a lot of things here. Um, they can have a real impact on lots of different things. So that's just a, a small snippet of what beavers will do. Um, there's plenty more that they can do, um, but that's the main things we're looking for at Wellington. Um, and the whole, the whole sort of theme of this is that everything they do is just going to benefit other species on reserve. Um, it's, that, it's even other species you wouldn't imagine would be on the wetland, sort of like your, your shrikes. There's evidence of shrikes coming back onto wetland areas because if the habitat's that good, they come and start hunting over the ponds and the pools and the meadows. And it's really cool to see. So we want to look at nature-based solutions too. Um, the biggest downside to our reserve at the moment of where it's situated for bee release is it, it's right in the catchment. Um, we're at the end of it now and we get straight into the trend. Um, so although we will be storing water and hopefully more water at Winton, the impacts of this further downstream won't be as big as if we had multiple beaver release sites up, up the catchment further up and multiple ponds and multiple, um, multiple storage areas. But we will help and it will make a difference. Um, so that's the main thing. So water management, the dams hold that water. Um, so it's not just the ponds that you can see behind the dams. Um, you'll also have the water seeping into the surrounding land. Um, when we went to see the Devon beavers, we walked through a, a beaver area. Um, and even like, even metres and metres and metres away from the ponds, the ground was just sodden. And all around us was drained farmers' fields and they were completely dry. And these, these beaver areas were just soaking wet. And so you have things like mosses in there. Um, people would say, oh, once the dam's full, that's it. It doesn't, it's not going to help anymore. Um, but it's all your vegetation that grows around it that absorbs this water. And then obviously, as they transpire and release the water, it goes back to the atmosphere and it's just a complete cycle and goes on and on. Um, so it helps us. It will help hold the water back. Um, but then also in the summer, the dams are leaky, so they're not impenetrable. Fish can get up and down them um, and they do release water slowly. Um, so in the summer, if you look at these, these ponds that are created here, this water will then be allowed to be released slowly throughout the summer. And what we're hoping this will do is to help to prevent the droughts in the summer because the water from the ponds is going to seep out slowly. Um, we also have carbon capture in these ponds. Um, so the dams that they create and the wetlands that they form and all the, uh, all the vegetation that grows is, is great for storing carbon. Um, so like I said, if you cut a tree down, obviously the tree does hold a lot of carbon. Um, but the vegetation that grows around the edges um, and the more diverse habitat you create in, it, it will hold vast amounts of carbon. So hopefully um, we can sort of show the evidence for this and help the government to decide that we need beavers back for a range of, a range of reasons. So around Willington, there is a fair bit of farmland, especially around the Eggington Brook. So that's what flows into, into the reserve. And, and when you go down and look at it in flood events, the water is just completely brown. It's a real dark brown colour. Um, and what this is from is, is all the runoff from the fields that comes into the brook. This washes down and that can, that can smother these gravel beds that I explained earlier. Um, so without these gravel beds, without these spawning areas for fish, you're not going to have the fish spawning. Um, and what these dams do is they, they capture this excess sediment um, that's washed, on, washed from the surrounding land. Um, so in these ponds, eventually you can get vegetation growing back again. Um, so not only are you trapping sediment, you're also trapping the excess nutrients that are being washed off from the, from the surrounding land as well. So the plants around the ponds and in the ponds, they'll be taking up the, uh, up the nutrients to help reduce nutrient loads. Um, and it gets trapped in the silt. And what you'll find sometimes with, with beaver dams is once, they, once they're happy, the air and they move on, eventually, because obviously the dams are still there, it silts up and silts up and silts up to the point where it completely dries out. And it becomes a really species rich, um, like sort of wildflower area. Um, for your plants to, to thrive. Um, so it's all irritation and then they'll move on and come back next time and it's a little spring, a little stream, sorry, and they'll dam it again and start the process over and over. So it's, it's an active environment. It's never stationary. It's always changing, um, which is what we want. We want, we want diversity and, and a sort of that activity at Willington. We want it to be an active site that's constantly changing and developing. So with the project, um, where it's, uh, we, uh, well, we're, we're expecting an increased interest in the reserve. Um, and with this comes obviously increased visits by the public, um, which is going to be great. 
And so from this, we can expect local businesses, such as pubs, your cafes and hotels. Um, we can expect them to, to, to see increased custom. And this has been shown in Devon um, when you've done the local surveys of the local, uh, local amenities. They, they said generally since the beavers have been released and it's public knowledge, they've seen a massive increase in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the uptake and people coming into the area. But we are aware Wellington's only small. We've got limited parking on reserve, which we are looking at fixing at some point. Um, so we're always going to suggest um, people to come by public transport. We've got a good train link. We've got the canal. People can walk down and bike down. Um, we've got good connections with Semex. Eventually, we'd like to sort of try and work out a way to have parking on there. So we are going to try and be as, as um, environmentally friendly as possible by suggesting that everyone comes and visits by public transport, which we know in reality is not going to happen, but we'll have a fair few people coming that way and preventing travel down to Willington because we're going to make it aware from the start that we haven't got that much parking and not to travel by car if, if possible. So again, this is our picture from Devon. And we spent an evening just sat watching um, just across the bank behind that big tree across the other side of the water. There's a lodge. Um, you see a couple of bubbles and you see ripples on the surface and a beaver pops up. It's, uh, it's incredible. So hopefully one, well, one day we'll all get to see that at Wellington. So how are we going to bring them back? So obviously we need funding for this. And we've been very fortunate to be awarded um, a total sum of 70, around £75,000 from BIFRA award. Um, so this is vital in it to enable us to do the project and also a very large sum of money from Seven Trent Water too. Um, so the funding that they've provided will support all the grounds work, including the installation of a specialised beaver fence. Um, and it's a very expensive fence. And this is because we don't want them to escape. The reason we're having at Willington is because the habitat managers like cattle, like sheep, we want them on the reserve. We don't want them to escape. Um, one day we do. One day we'd like them wild again in Derbyshire. But for now, we'd really like our beavers to stay where they're put. So we're, we're, we've been working with Natural England, um, with uh, na um, the Environment Agency, and with some very, very smart contractors to design our fence line. And we've had um, great support from Derek Gow, who's helped us from the start to make sure that we have a really high tech, strong and secure fence line. So as well as this, obviously we've got the brook. So we're going to, have to put a water gate on the brook to prevent the beavers from swimming out the enclosure. And all this fence line, people are concerned about things getting in and out. So obviously your birds, your smaller mammals and all your invertebrates, things like that, will be able to get in and out of the reserve. Otters, they'll happily climb the fence and get in there that way. We, with the uh, water gates, we can make them a little bit wider, which prevents an adult beaver getting in, but allows, getting out, sorry, but allows an otter to come in and out quite freely. Um, and then, yes, so this money's also gone towards the acquisition of beavers and all the relevant health checks. Um, but with these health checks, obviously, we don't want any diseased or uh, damaged beavers coming in. Um, so we're getting them from Scotland at Tayside. And they'll all be health checked and tested before coming down. Um, so we know we've got healthy, healthy beavers. So we've also done a, a crowdfunder, which is very positive. We had so much support. It's amazing. Um, so our members, supporters, volunteers um, and the public have arranged a considerable sum of money. And that's meant it's it's tips over the edge to be able to have beavers because it is a very expensive project. Um, and, but not only this, some people haven't been able to fund their supporters financially and they're giving us their time um, by sharing our campaign with other people, raising awareness, offering their time as a volunteer and just giving us support. And that's just as important because we need support. Um, so you, like I say, even people haven't donated, what the outs they've done is, is cracking as well. We've, it's really helped to put the project on the map and get people interested and excited. So although uh, beavers were once native until obviously we hunted them to extinction, um, we do, they're not native anymore. So they're not recognized at the moment as a native species in England. In Scotland, they are not in England. Um, so to have beavers on reserve, we do need to have different licenses. Um, so one of them is the fence license. So this is a specific fence license, not just like a standard um, stock fence. It's very heavy duty and it's going to be really well designed. Um, so we need we need this license to come through. Uh, well, sorry, we need a license to actually do this fence, and that comes from Natural England. And then we also need license for the beavers, and this is to capture them, to release them, and to have them on our reserve. And Natural England have provided with all these licenses. It's, it's taken a while. We've had to do quite a lot of amendments to our plans and our method statement. Um, but we've got through. We've got our licenses, um, which means we can have beavers at Willington. So where are they coming from? 
where they're going to be and how much, uh, how many, sorry. So I said earlier, they'll come from Scotland. They are wild caught. This is because in the mo at the moment, Scotland are culling the beavers. Um, this is because they think there's too many up there. Uh, the main issue with this is that they haven't really got a proper management plan in place for mitigating any negative impacts of beavers. So uh, localised flooding of lands. It's not massive wide scale flooding. It's just, it is localised flooding. Um, but there's ways to rectify this. So you can have beaver volunteer teams that can go and they can take dams down. They can put pipes through dams and it lowers the level of water. Um, so there's lots of ways to get around any impacts. Um, but yeah, like I say currently they're, they're culling them. So we're we're not doing it, but Roshi and Campbell, Dr. Roshi and Campbell and Derek Gow, um, between them, they've been organising all the captures and bringing them down for testing and then releases in the UK, say the UK, in Britain, um, not in Ireland, sorry. Um, so they'll, like I said, there'll be health checked before they come through so we know that they're all good to go. So where will they be? Well, they'll have the right to roam our reserves. So they will have just under 47 hectares of land to utilise. What's quite cool about our reserve is that it's, um, our enclosure, sorry, is a perimeter of our reserve, which means that you will be able to walk into the enclosure. Um, so you can see in this picture, we're very close to those ponds. You probably won't be able to get that close to our beavers. Uh, I don't know though, because some of the platforms are right on the water's edge. So if they do come a bit further afield, you might get to see them. Um, but again, you've got to be quite fortunate. So we'll be really introducing two beaver families onto our reserve. The area has been, been deemed big enough to have two families. Um, so this will be consisting of two males, um, uh, two female and male pairs, sorry. Um, if we can get their offspring as well, we'll have some offspring with them. But the, the basic amount we're going to have, the, the minimum amount is a pair of two pairs of male and female beavers. Um, and they'll both be released opposite ends of the reserve. Both sides of the beavers reserve, both of the sides, sorry, have perfect habitat for beavers. There's plenty of food availability, there's plenty of shelter and there's plenty of open water. So they should settle in very quickly. And what they'll do as well is they are territorial and they do live in their own family units. So we're expecting them to create roughly in the middle. It might not be in the middle. One family might want more space, but they'll create their own territories. And what they do for this is they create mud piles and mounds of mud, and then they scent it with castorium and urine, um, which is a, a, scent that they, uh, a scent that they produce. And they'll scent these piles They'll also go up and maintain them, and if they see a beaver in the area, they'll do a little dance to scare them off so they don't come into too close contact with the other families. And that's that's sort of in the wild how they sort of regulate their numbers and ages. They, in the wild, 10 to 15 years, this is because the family units don't want to mix. So if they do come across and they can't have any more space, they will fight. Um, because they've got really big teeth, and really strong teeth, they are big, strong animals, um, they'll cause nicks and cuts on them and they can get infected and they can die. So this is a way in the, in the wild of them um, regulating their numbers. In captivity, in enclosures, and at the moment, if they were wild releases, they probably live a lot longer because they haven't got this competition. And it's mainly because they can just push each other out the area. There's plenty of habitat availability at the moment for them. So we shouldn't be seeing any, any arguments on our reserve at the moment. Um, but we do have plans in place for when obviously they do breed and the families get bigger and bigger. Um, we do have a maximum number of how many beavers we can have on a reserve, but we'll be monitoring this, keeping on top of it, and then hopefully we'll be using our beavers for other release, releases in the UK. And by the time there's that many, that we might be able to just release them into the wild anyway. So as part of our uh, beaver programme, we want to increase the visitor experience on the site. Um, so we love the reserve, it's an amazing place, but we still feel it can be a bit disconnected from the local community. A lot of people want to go on circular walks. Um, Willington is a straight walk down one track and back down the same one. Um, so a lot of people are put off by this, but they do like to experience their local area. Um, so what we want to do is connect our reserve to the surrounding area. So what we have next door is Semex, as I explained earlier. They, uh, they are still extracting gravel from certain areas, but they finish extraction in others. And what they're doing is moving on. As they move on, they restore their, their land back to nature. So what we want to do is put a bridge over the brook between us and Semex. And what this will do is create a, a five mile circular loop and that'll go through our reserve onto Semex, onto the canal, which is to the north of our reserve, and then back into Willington. Um, so this will help encourage more people onto the reserve, also into the wilder area. Um, so we want to make it accessible to as many people as possible because it is a cracking area. So we're always trying to, again, it's visitor experience. We, we are quite um, 
we really want to improve it. So what we are hoping to do is install a few more hides um, platforms. Um, one thing that we've put in in the bid for at the moment is to make a multi-story hide because our reed beds are really extensive, which means sometimes it's difficult to actually see past the reed beds onto the islands and into the wetland areas, which could hinder our chances of seeing a beaver potentially. So we would like to put a raised, um, like a two or three story high uh, hide on there, which will mean you get a really good vantage point across the whole reserve and you won't, your view won't be hindered by the, by the reed beds. And also we want to update all the platforms at the moment we've got, make them bigger and, and more accessible. So, because we, we're going to expect more people to be on site, we're going to create a small visitor centre. It's not a big place to go get a drink and to buy stuff. It very much is an information bomb, which is only open certain times of the day if there's people there to man it. And so we'd like more staff and volunteer on site and you can explain what's going on, explain what's in the area, and also we can lead guided tours. So I'd, I'd really like to be able to lead guided beaver tours once they set in, um, once they settled into the reserve. So um, people ask us all the time how they can help out. Um, memberships are great. It means that we got the funding and support to deliver our projects. A lot of our projects we do, we have to have written support from members, from the public, from local, um, local businesses. Um, and we do do door drops and we do do mailing lists to people. Um, so we can put a mailing list out and get support from our 14,000 plus members. It really shows uh, funders what we're about and how much people are interested in what we're doing. Um, but also it means we can buy more land for nature reserves. We can extend these lands. And it also gives us the funding to protect these even better than we are already. Um, and also we have some really cool beaver and badger adoption packs, as you can see here. Um, so as you see on the picture, you get a key ring, you get cards, you get a bit of information about beavers and you get a nice cuddly beaver. I've got one at home um, it's really cool. Um, so that obviously provides funding for us to carry on with our projects. Um, and also volunteering, we're always grateful for volunteers. They, like I said, they do the bulk of the work on reserves. I could be on there myself with a team of 12 to 15 minimum volunteers. Um, so it really makes a difference to what we do. Volunteers are essential to how we run and we really, really see it. We're really supportive of them and we have to thank them so much for the support. Um, but this can be anything from practical volunteering. It could be volunteering in the office. We have admin work, we have shop work to do. We are packing of online orders. Um, and also we've got a really good team of um, sort of retired ecologists who'd like to help spend their time serving our reserves. And at Willington at the moment, this is massive. We've got so many people interested in helping us out. Um, so if you want to get involved, please do get in touch. Uh, you can either contact our inquiries team or you can contact me directly. Um, so my email is just there if you want to get in touch with myself. Um, like I said, any capacity at all. If you want to give an hour a week, that's perfect. If you want to give two or three hours a week, if you want to do two or three days, as much as it as you want to give, we'd really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, George. That was so interesting and so exciting uh, to hear about all the projects and the ideas coming through. So really, really excited to hear uh, and to see that develop over time. Um, We've had quite a few questions come in and they're, they're really piling in now as, as you finish speaking and people are talking. So we'll I'll work through those just uh, in the order that they came through. Um, and just just before I start on the questions, we had a lovely message in the chat saying um, Jen, aged eight, who adopted a beaver for Christmas. So really, oh, really glad you're here, Jen, and, and listening into this. OK, so on to the questions. Uh, first one from Lawrence. And we had a, a similar one uh, further down from Paula as well. Uh, do otter and beaver coexist happily? Yeah, so um, beavers are too big for an otter to worry about attacking them. Um, and they will live happy together. So the way be uh, beavers create their habitat, it, it creates a really diverse habitat, which benefits otters. It brings in fish, it brings in prey for otters to eat or feed on. So they'll come into beaver areas more readily because it's a better habitat for them. Um, there is anecdotal evidence of otters taking very young beavers as they first come out of the lodge. Um, but by the time it's, the time it's growing a little bit, they, they very much are too big for an otter to worry about. And um, because beavers are herbivores, they won't try and feed off an otter. They'll just push them out of the area and try and scare them off. Um, but they'll happily live together. They, uh, and like I said, they'll probably come in more because the habitat is better for them. And if you look at the uh, river otter beaver trial, there's some cracking footage of both beavers and otters on camera. It's very great to see. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next question from David. Uh, what are the prospects for truly wild beavers in the UK rather than small reserve enclosures? So that's really interesting. Yeah. So there's two currently that I'm aware of. There's two sort of groups that are working to bring beavers back into the wild in, in England. And um, one of them is the Beaver Trust. Um, so that is a specific trust set up for beaver reintroductions in the UK. So they're lobbying landowners, the government to allow beavers to be given native status. Um, once again, which would mean wild releases are feasible again. Um, and also the wildlife trusts are have got their own beaver consultancy sort of team, which I did start to be part of, but I've kind of dropped off at the moment. But I'd like to get back on it. And again, we're working on the same thing. We're working with them um, on similar ideas and how we can lobby the government. Um, where The way the trusts are doing it is really interesting because we, you need to have the landowners on side and to understand beavers and what they do, same with angling clubs, same with other, other things like that. There's a lot of misinformation and misconceptions about beavers, um, which can be quite damaging because if you get so-and-so said this, so-and-so said that, beavers eat fish, that's where it gets to. And obviously beavers don't eat fish. Um, so what you need to do is work with the landowners, get them on a the side, and then we can all lobby the government together to make them a, a native species again and allow for wide releases. And I think with the climate change, with the, the 30 by 30 and all this that's going on, I think they are considering it and they are giving it a good thought because it is a way, as I said earlier, carbon capture, flood storage, nature restoration, it does all that for you. And the cost of managing for a, a wild family of beavers is so much less than it is to manage for flooding, building flood defences, insurances and all that. You can have beaver volunteers and teams that are paid nothing and it, it, it works out a lot more cost effective to manage for beavers and it's to manage for flooding and the beavers will do it naturally. So I think there is real potential. It's, it's, it is, we are pushing, the beaver trusts are pushing and we're very confident that it will go through eventually, but it is all about working with landowners and making sure you've got those plans in place before they're released. Because the last thing you want is a wild release and then the farmer going off, on, not going off on, sorry, a farmer getting upset, which they can do, they've got all rights to, because there's not that plan in place for how to manage. It is very easy to manage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, um, the questions are coming in fast here. So uh, next one from Tom. How will the Beavers Lodge be impacted by the annual flooding? I think you did mention that one in, in the, the presentation as well. Yeah, so I've seen a couple of sites where Beavers have created a lodge and moved on from it. They realise it's not where they want it and they've moved. They can build quite quickly. They will use things like tree, oh, tree plates. So when a tree's blown over, you can see the roots. They will shelter in there overnight. For protection until they build a new lodge um, but they can build multi-story lodges as well um, so they can build them higher so there's one area for us to get to the next one um, and even, like I say if they get washed out it won't take them long to find a new spot and to build a new one but I would think at Willington there's plenty of dry areas which are surrounded by water which I've got in my head and the volunteers have got in their heads that they're going to use to build a lodge and we're guessing we don't know they might not but we think, oh, that'd be a perfect place for a lodge. So there's got there's plenty of place in Willington to build a lodge. And it's not a problem if it gets washed out because they'll build a new one anyway. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, next question from Marie. Uh, Mary, sorry. How much wood is needed to support a family of beavers? Um, will there be a limit on how long Willington Nature Reserve will provide sufficient resources for the beavers? Yeah. So um, a, a good thing about beavers, when, if, when you first release them onto a site, they'll start to coppice trees and create a food cache and stick pop sticks into the, into the wood um, to create the food source. So they'll grow their own sort of gardens of willow and stuff. Um, so they, they think about that as well. So they'll create their own little food area so they can do that to, to keep them going. But they'll realise after the first year, there's so much food source at Willington that they won't need to do that and they'll feed off what we've got. Willington is so big and it's so diverse. We've got so much habitat for them that we can't envision in the, anywhere near in the near future that they'll run out of food availability. And if we find that maybe it's, we've lost all the trees, which we probably won't do, we, I don't think we've got any risk of that. We've lost all the reed beds. We'll be keeping on top of it to monitor it. And with reed beds growing and how they grow, they grow from rhizos under the ground. They'll just keep popping up year on year on year. That's a really good food source. They'll eat all the grass in the meadow so we can limit the grazing to allow the beavers to get in, well, limit the cattle grazing, sorry, to allow the beavers to graze the, the fields and they can take the grass out of there. The, the, honestly there's so much food availability that I don't think we'd ever have that issue um, 
our release site is very big. And if you go to other release sites where they've got eight hectares compared to 47, 47 hectares, and they've got one family beavers in the eight hectares, there's like so much food there still, and they've been there 10, 15 years. It's, it, yeah, <laughs> I hope I've explained it, but because Winston's so big, and I know the family sizes grow, but they'll always reach that carry capacity and we'll get, we'll move them on to a new place. There'll be plenty of food availability for them. Um, and it's not just wood either. Like I said, it's, it's reeds, it's bramble, it's grasses, it's flowers, it's all sorts that I'll eat. Plenty, plenty for them to eat. Very diet for them. Thank you. Uh, okay, next one from Lawrence. How do you avoid stagnant gene pools, starting with just the two pairs? Yeah, so they're a family unit. Um, so it's only the male and female adults in the family unit that will mate and have offspring. And so first year's offspring will then raise the second year's offspring like auntie and uncles. Um, so they won't inbreed in their families. Um, but yes, definitely if our two families kick the older young out because they're getting too big, there's too many in the family and those two mix and have offspring. And then they keep doing that cycle where as they get kicked out, you will end up with a stagnant gene pool. Um, so you'll get bottlenecking and that sort of thing. Um, so what, what, we, what we're doing is not again Trent University are working on a plan to monitor their genes and monitor where they come from and who's breeding with what to make sure that doesn't happen. But what, because our license is only for a certain amount of beavers on our reserve and I can't remember, so I'm sorry about this, but I think it is 12 beavers, which isn't a lot. I think that's our maximum. So once we hit that number, we'll be taking them out and moving them on to other places and we'll be monitoring where they've gone so we know they're not going to inbreed. Um, but that's how we're going to get around it. And I'm really interested to see how Nottingham Trent University come out with this monitoring plan to make sure we've got a good genetic diversity across, across, the, uh, across England. Lovely, thank you. I'm just scrolling through some of the questions. Um, brilliant, okay, uh, next one from Anonymous. So whoever sent this one in, uh, what is the maximum number of beavers allowed at Willington once they breed? Yeah, I think it is 12. Like, um, I think I answered that last time, didn't I, just then? So I, I think it is 12, but I can find out for certain. Um, uh, but yeah, 12 will be it, which isn't that many. <laughs> if you think they have two to three young each year, it won't be long until we've hit our, hit our number. But the trouble is with beavers, <laughs> if, they're very, if they're out of the way, we can't see them. We won't know what they've had. We've got to capture them within a year yeah. of them being born so we can tag them and monitor them. Sometimes, apparently, you can't even see them. You won't even know you've had another year's offspring because you don't get to see them. Yeah. Wellington's so big and so dense. Uh, it might of, be quite tricky. A lot of monitoring coming forward. Maybe you oh, yeah. can use some of those for, for other Midlands trusts looking to introduce beavers as well. Yeah, definitely. That'd be great. Um, so you mentioned developing a larger car park. Do you have plans to, to have an area to securely park cycles as well for that sustainable transport? Definitely, yeah. That's something we're looking into as well. Because um, obviously we want to promote sustainable transport. So we need these infrastructure in place to allow that to happen. Um, I'm a massive mountain biker and road bike. Well, I like to go on the road biker as well. So for me, definitely, I'd want that in there as well. Fantastic. But we'll be planning that. Brilliant. Um, this next question, a lot of people have been asking this. Uh, the project has been delayed due to COVID. Do you know roughly when we might be able to expect to see them on the reserve? Yes. So um, we've been able to go back out and reserve. We've had volunteer teams clearing the fence line the last two weeks. Um, so we've been clearing the fence line, we're going through the woodland to create a ride, which is really cool because it's so dense, I showed you. We're now allowing light into there. So even though we've got a fence in there, all the vegetation will start to grow around it too. Um, so now that's happening, it means that we can talk to our contractor about getting started. Um, we're hoping, again, this is not set, but we're hoping to start in the next couple of weeks on the fence. And we need to get it done before the nesting season because um, we don't want to do any work during that season. Um, which means that we've, we've got a short window to get it, the fencing done. Um, and then for the release, I can't give any more information at the moment because we don't know how the fence is going to go yet. It'll definitely be this year, 100% this year. It's just, it is so, so sad. And it, <laughs> it's been really hard for the whole team that have been working on it, the staff and the volunteers, because we should have had them last year. Um, but we'll get there. We will, we will, definitely. Um, fantastic. Um, Will there be much knock-on effect to the waterways in Derby to, to have in the beavers at Willington? Unfortunately not. Um, so because we're at the end of the catchment, any water that flows into it is going to go straight into the Trent. So we will hold the water back. So you'll be able to see the benefits from the reserve point of view because our meadows might be wetter longer during the year. 
um, that in Derby, no. So what we want to do after this project, we want to make sure it goes well, we want to do the monitoring, we'd like to do more projects in Derbyshire. Um, work with more landowners, more people, get more beavers across the site, across the across Derbyshire, sorry. And that's where you really see the impact. Once we get up to the headlands and start doing them in smaller areas, more smaller areas, build up and build up and build up, that's when we'll really start to see the benefit. But even just one family, there's one family in Devon, which a beaver, sorry, which stopped flooding further down the stream. There's a bit of road that always flooded and it stopped people being able to get to school. And the once the beavers were introduced, that road never flooded again. So I don't know if the school kids are happy or not. But I don't think the parents are happy because they can get to school. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, and then will you be charging to see the beavers? And will there be any additional security on site to protect the beavers with them being permanent residents? When yeah. they come in? Cool. So because um, you can walk into the reserve, um, we might be able to see them from the platforms and from the hide that's currently there. If they do try to go into a more secretive area away from people, then chances are it would be very slim that you get to see them. Um, so we would like to do guided tours of the reserve um, and we'll, we'll probably run these like we run our sort of bat walks and things like that it'll be like a education session marks being able to look for them that sort of thing so they, there could be a small charge for it um, per person or per family per per visit um, and we'll obviously we'll have to keep these numbers quite low because we don't want to have too many people in the beaver enclosure well in the middle of the beaver enclosure in case we speak and we've got a lot of sensitive wildlife in there as well as beavers so we will be doing it and um like I said, I think, I can't say for certain, but I think there will be a small charge to be able to run those events. And then you said security, didn't you? Yeah, any yeah. additional security on site to protect the beavers. Yeah, so we're working with a, a large um, security company that does sort of live feed cameras, sensor cameras, stuff like that, that run a solar power. So we'll be able to install, hopefully we'll be able to install a few of them on the site, um, on the key points, so we can see what's going on. And we're fortunate to have a lot of volunteers that live close by. Um, so we've got people on hand and we've got a really good um, relationship with the rural crime team as well. Um, so we've got plenty of plenty of security and uh, help to sort any problems out. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, just from John, remind me how you're going to manage the other wild animals and ensure they can still disperse and utilise their natural territories with regards to the beaver enclosure. So he's mentioned otters, fox and badgers. Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't really explain too much into that, did I? Uh, so start with the badgers, they're an easy one. You can put badger gates onto the edge of the fence. Um, so we've got Helen and Andrew who are on this call at the moment. Uh, they have been setting camera traps around the reserve to monitor what's here and where the key points of activity are. So we know where the beavers are, beavers, I haven't got beavers yet. We know where the badgers are coming in and out of our reserve and their tracks that they take. So on these points where the fence is gonna go, we can put badger gates in um, and it allows the, I don't, I don't know how, <laughs> it allows the badgers in and out, but it doesn't let the beavers in and out. And I, I don't, I'm ashamed to say, I'm not really sure how, I think it might be because badgers are smaller and it, the beavers can't fit. There's one way, it's, it works somehow. <laughs> so that's one way for the badgers. Again, the foxes, um, the foxes should be able to jump most of the fences, um, apart from the really high fences that we're putting in. Um, we've got one area where it's flooded a lot, so we have to have a higher fence. Um, so they won't be able to get over this bit, but everywhere else on the reserve, they should be able to jump the fence. And otters are very good climbers. Um, unless there's an overhang directly on the outskirt, outside, then the otters will be able to climb up and over it. Um, there's loads of beaver introductions where they've done this, not a problem at all. And also we can put on our water gates that go across the brooks, we can make certain bits wider, which allows the otters to swim out because they're a lot smaller than beavers. Um, but the only trouble with this is the very young beavers can actually get through this gap. So we might not do that. Yeah, I was just wondering about the young ones. Yeah. 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 Um, brilliant, thank you. So next one from Toby. Do beavers have a natural predator? I know you mentioned the wildcats um, that used to, to predate on them, but in the UK at the moment, do they have a natural predator? Not I'm aware of at the moment. Um, so mink are quite ferocious, but I think even the young beavers will be way too big for a mink to take. They'll probably try it, but they, I don't should come in and see them off. Um, like I say, otters, they can take, I've heard they can take baby, baby beavers when they first come out of the lodge. But not anymore, no. But they still have the instinct to create the dams and create deep water. Um, but it would have been the old wildcats. Wonderful. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um... One from Lawrence. Do you have problems with Himalayan balsam on the site and do beavers eat this? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so along in our wet woodlands at the back, we do. Um, so they, they, um, we've been, 
managing that for a few years and it you never seem to get anywhere with it. Um, it's just ongoing. So we've got who the main boss in the wet ones at the back and there's a little bit on the actual Lakington Brook. Um, so viewers do eat Himalayan balsam. Um, hopefully, they might have an impact. If they don't, we'll carry on doing our, our bit to remove it. Um, but they'll, they will take Himalayan balsam, yes. Brilliant. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, and two questions quite similar here from Tony and Mary and from Sharon. Are there water voles at Willington now? And if not, could they be introduced? And could other reintroduction species be released on the reserve? Or would it, are you just specialising in beavers at the moment? Yeah. So... We think we have water voles. We've got um, we've got a really cool video of what we. It's very hard to tell because we haven't really got that much um, sort of background things to to gauge the size of it. But it is very much swimming exactly like a water vole would swim, um, and it's sort of in the area where two years ago I found a lawn which is very indicative of a water vole where it feeds and makes a little lawn around its holes and there's holes in the bank and there's holes in the water and there's holes on top of the bank. And we have found feeding signs like the 45 degree angle cuts through the stems of plants and also the 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 droppings as well so we think <laughs> we still need to 100 percent confirm it and we've put cameras out and had nothing on them and then we've had mice which it definitely wasn't a mouse um so we're quite positive we have but it, it, it could be one of those where it could be a perfect site to release them the only trouble is we do have mink on reserve and we it wouldn't really be right to release water voles onto the site when we know we've got mink there still, which obviously the mink is a bad thing if you have got water vole now. Um, so, yeah, I don't think in the near future, I don't think we will be releasing water voles purely because of, of the mink, because it wouldn't be fair. Um, but there's other things you can look into. So if anyone's heard of Derek Gow, he's very interesting. He's, he's worth a follow on Twitter and also to try and see him if he does any talks. He was talking about tree frogs, but British tree frogs. Um, and he's like it's a frog <laughs> it's not going <laughs> to upset the ecosystem why can't we have them back again and there's there's evidence of them and there's the bones that you can find in the brooks and stuff and when you're digging stuff up so things like that uh, grass snakes because um, it'd be perfect for grass snakes it is now and they have they have we have cited them before and um, so anything like that it, it could be a potential for reintroductions and i think the trusts are looking at doing more introduction reintroductions in the future um, but it's all down to staff time, volunteer time, funding. So if anybody would like to get involved in the reintroductions, you'd like to volunteer your time, I'm sure the trust would be very happy to, to, to work with you on it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks for that one. Uh, I think you have covered this one um, about the fences, but from Donna, would there be any risk of beavers es escaping from the enclosure? Yeah, there's, al not. there's always a risk. <laughs> um, I don't know if... There was a release recently where it was public knowledge where beaver got out within the first week or so. Um, so what you do when they get out is you don't worry. You just wait. You don't go chase it. You wait until it's spotted. And then you go get it. Because if you try and chase it up the trend, you don't know where it is. You could be canoeing up it, boating up it, and you never see it. So you just wait. And someone says, I found a beaver. It's found my pond. It's, it's quite happy with my little stream. You go with the occasion, you trap it. So the reason we've spent so long writing our method statement and our fence spec and we work with Derek Gow is because we don't want that to happen. We want them on reserve, which is why we've got very expensive over-engineered fence to keep them in. Um, so we've got mesh on the ground that goes out from the fence, we've got mesh that goes into the ground and we've got overhangs in certain areas, other areas it's twice as high. We've, we've, we've like scoped out the reserve to know where exactly each bit of fence needs to go, but there's always that issue. There's always an issue that they could get out but we're quite confident they won't and we don't want them to anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've got a question about volunteering next. Um, if people have contacted you recently or if they're going to contact you after this talk, um, kind of what, I suppose, what timescale, what, what kind of things can people get involved with at the moment as well with, with COVID? Yeah. Um, yeah. If anyone else on the call haven't heard from me back yet, it's been quite busy at the moment. Um, and currently we can't really do too much volunteering because of COVID. But we will be starting again soon, hopefully, and I'll get back to everyone to know, let them know exactly what's going on. So but we can talk about that later. Yeah, uh, thank you. Okay, so from Aidan, if beavers were reclassified as native, would you expect them to colonise the Hilton Brook, or is that too small? Uh, and will areas like this with all the new housing scare beavers off? Uh, all, and the Himalayan balsam, which uh, I think you answered just before. Yeah. yeah. Um, so 
potentially yes, Hills and Brook. Um, it's yeah, it's small, um, but they create what they want. So if you think about when when you cut your own little dams in the woodlands, it doesn't take long for you to get a pond. Um, they will dam the water to make what they need, and it would quite it is quite impressive what they do. Like if you look at some of the wild releases, they'll go onto these little streams which are a trickle. So where we went to Devon, when we started at the top of the catchment and walked down, it was a tiny, tiny little stream. And you get to the middle where the beavers are and it's massive ponds. So they will make what they want. Um, so, but because there's not many beavers in, in Derbyshire at the moment, or in England that is, there's none, um, in the Midlands, sorry, then they might not choose Hilton Brook as their site to go to. They might go find another bit of habitat. It's when the area starts to get saturated with beavers that's when they'll start to colonise these areas that they wouldn't normally want because that's all they've got there. Um, but it shouldn't matter. Um, and in Bavaria, stuff like that, they do live happily side by side with people. Um, they're very good over there because they know how to manage for beavers and they know what they're doing. They know how to put these little deceivers in to allow the flow. Um, and there's evidence of the, the pictures and videos of them walking through a public park because they're in the canal that goes through a park. So the housing estate, like I said, again, they probably won't choose that to start with, but there's nothing really stopping them. And once we get many more of them, they could uh, they could start coming in. Yeah. So people and beavers learning to live together. Yeah. Brilliant. So a good question here um, from Anonymous again. Do you think beavers could be impacted by climate change and how? Yeah. yeah. So if you look at how climate change could impact their habitat, really. And so for a brook and a stream, you might think in the winter you get heavier flows. In the summer, you get smaller flows because there's more droughts going on. Um, so it's how the dams cope with this. The dams might be able to mitigate for this quite readily. Um, but yeah, the, the flow of water might change. So in winter, the heavier, stronger flows could start to knock some of the dams down. But to be honest, they're very, very heavy, heavily engineered dams. Um, things like your changing of wet meadows, they might dry out in the summer more. It might change your vegetation structure from one type of plant to another because they can cope with droughts and more tolerant. Um, so it depends on sort of what thing you're looking at climate change because you can have climate change impacts on woodlands, grasslands, open water, reed beds. There's so many different things that can happen. But we'd imagine that beavers would mitigate for this by creating their dams and storing its water. And I'm only focusing really on the water side of it. Um, but even if climate change just continue, I think beavers would be really key in helping to mitigate it. They won't stop it, but they'll mitigate for it. And you might find that eventually the only way, only place you've got wildlife is around these beaver areas because it's the only thing that is natural anymore and it's only got the only bits that have actually got water. Um, but there could be, like I said. Um, but if you go, there's a, a really good document on the impacts of climate change on all the different habitats. Um, so wet grasslands, dry grasslands, acid, acidic, neutral. Um, if you search it, it tells you exactly what they're predicting to happen on climate change and how it impacts these areas. And you can read these and compare it to what beavers do and how they can mitigate it. Um, so it's a very deep, broad question, to be fair. It's, um, you can go for ages about it if you keep attacking it <laughs> a little bit. A bit unknown, really, isn't it? But be interesting to see. Um, okay, thank you very much. So do you have a good relationship with the Angling Club and I suppose the lo other local community groups uh, around Willington as well, um, so adjacent to the reserve? Yeah, so I do think we have a really good relationship with the Angling Club. Um, there, I think it was a chair, I can't remember now, so again, that might not be right. Uh, did show his support for the project and the, they wrote his letter of support for our funding project and to go to Natural England. Uh, and they also fed down to their members because um, there was quite a few members that weren't happy um, about the prospect of beavers. And again, it's because they uh, just miss misinformation that they've received from someone else, really. So there's things like eating fish and um, things like flooding the whole area, which I'm definitely not going to do. Um, and then we spoke to them, spoke to the, I think it was the chair, like I said, and he passed it down. And now the majority are quite supportive of us, um, more than more than not. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, the otters at Wellington, yep. Yeah. So I think their main concern at the England Club was the mink. Um, so I think mink over, over otter, I think they're more concerned about the mink. And I know some, again, it's not all, some anglers aren't happy with otters. Um, but... I think most a lot of anglers do actually like to see otters swimming up and down. Um, and we've had no negative feedback since we've mentioned the otters from the, the Angling Club. Um, and again, I just think they like to see them as well. And it's the, I think they're aware that they're right next to the Trent, they're right next to the Nature Reserve, so they've got to expect wildlife to come in and out. 
So, yeah. Um, and then the parish council are massively supportive as well. Um, and the locals, so we did a door drop um, to the local area. And it was, again, massively in support of the project. Um, it's, it's great to see. Brilliant. That's fantastic. Uh, so we've got a few similar questions here about the uh, the circular walk, um, I suppose the infrastructure of the site as well. So um, when do you envisage the circular walk being complete? Um, do you have a map of the circular walk? And then the start of the track and the car park does get flooded. So are there any plans to overcome this as well? Yeah, so currently we have got all the support we need to put our application in for funding for the, uh, for the bridge. Uh, we've got all the funding needed um, to put our application forward. So we have to get a certain amount of funding in before the main funder will give us the rest. So this is hopefully going, um, hopefully going soon to be agreed. Um, well, go off for um, approval, hopefully. That's what we're hoping for. And uh, so once this happens, I, think, I can't remember off the top of my head, it will be within the year though. Not, it might not be this year, but it will be within 24 months that the, the track will be done and the circular route will be open. Um, and so we will we'll be able to do a map. Um, we have got, a, I did do a map for the proposed route. Um, we just need to approve it with Semex because obviously they're an active quarry and some of it will be on their access track. Um, but we'll be releasing a map of where it's going to go. Um, and hopefully it'll be bigger than five miles in the next few years, as well as we take on more and more land. Um, and yeah, the, the track floods and you can be out of the reserve for a couple of months at a time. Um, but the only way to get around this would be, well, there's a couple of ways, is to build, to raise the track up. But then what we're doing is creating a flood bank and it stops the reserve from flooding as much. And we don't want to do this because we want the reserve to flood as much as possible. Um, so that, that's kind of our question. You can put culverts in, but again, we're, we're still restricting the flow of water. We want it to be open and be a floodplain as it should be. Um, and then we could do a, a raised boardwalk, um, but we have to access it with traffic, of, um, with vehicles. Um, so we have trailers with cattle in there, we have four befores, and we'd have to have really heavy duty boardwalk, which when it floods, it could get washed out with the debris hitting it. So there's there's no real way, there is ways to do it, but there's no ways that we're really considering because it's unfortunate that people can't get in there in the winter, but we want to highlight the fact that it's an active floodplain and it's doing what it does yeah. and we're not hindering yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a natural space. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, again, a couple of similar, que similar questions here from Donna and from Kath. How many beavers make up a typical family uh, and do they disperse from the family unit? So they, the young um, will disperse once yeah. they're old enough, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that all, uh, I think the, I'm not 100% sure on this one. Um, so I'm more into the beaver ecology as opposed to the how they, they work as a family unit. But I'd imagine that the family unit would get to the size where there's no longer the carry capacity for them in that area. So if you have four or five young or six or seven young, it might get to the point where it's getting a bit crowded in the lodges. There's not as much food availability for them. So they can, uh, they can push them out of there um, and, and kick them out of the family unit. And so they disperse from the family unit when they get to a certain age and they're getting pushed out um, to find the new territories or to find a mate. That's when they'll usually get dispersed from the family unit. So they do, they do clear off. Clear off, sorry. They do, <laughs> they do disperse. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and then a couple of questions about tagging as well. So from David, do are, are you planning to tag them so that you can identify them? Um, and someone else put another one down here. Uh, how do you capture them for tagging? Yeah. So we will have to tag them. So each year when we when we think they've had young, we'll obviously go out and try and capture them, and then we'll tag them. And uh, so this helps us to know how many we've got. Um, keeps keeps track of it and also keeps Natural England happy that we're keeping on top of the monitoring. Um, so to capture it, you got um, this. I've recently learned from a volunteer of a new um, way to to capture beavers. But the one I know and one that's sort of currently the way to do it is you get a big cage, like a very big cage, because beavers can be up to fifty kilograms. They're pretty large, and it's um, sort of you lift one end up, you set a trigger in the middle, they walk into the trap, sets the trigger off, and it shuts. So it's a big, big cage, which you need two people to, to maneuver, especially when it's a 50 kilogram um, beaver in there. So what you can do, you can, um, you can put it on their access track. So from what I saw in Devon, they're quite, they do use their routes quite regularly. They, they know where to go, they go from one place to the other. 
Um, they like to use canals to swim through, but if they can have to walk on dry land, they will do. And you can place it on the, their, their walk and they'll walk through it and it sets it off. Um, but it's very tricky, apparently, to actually catch a beaver. But it, 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 <laughs> it obviously is possible and that's how we would do it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Those, we're getting through these. We've got five, well, just under five minutes to go. So uh, we'll see how how many more of these we can we can I'll get try done. And, try and get it. Try and whistle through them. Okay. Quicker. So, do you think uh, in the future you may be supplying other sites in England with beavers from your stock? Yeah. So we don't want to call them. Um, that's that's never going to be an option for us. It's it's not what we're going to do. We won't support that in the wild. So while we support that on our reserve. Um, so yes, if we can get this monitoring place where we know which beavers are which and where they've come from we'd like to be able to use ours to supply other sites in England. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. Uh, from Richard, you said there's three trusts in the Midlands putting beavers or wanting to put beavers into the wild. Um, so who who are they? Yeah, sorry, I, I might have said it wrong, it's, it's two. Um, so there's us and there is Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust who are thinking of it, planning it, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. brilliant, thank you. I uh, just mentioned the cult. Uh, so you're doing any baseline um, species surveying to see how the diversity changes. I think that's quite a lot of what your volunteers are doing at the moment. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. Um, so drone surveys, camera drop footage. We've done a quick vegetation survey. We have got data from birds, um, from bats, um, from amphibian and reptiles, stuff like that. Uh, probably not as much as we'd like to have. Um, but we're quite fortunate that if we don't release the beavers till sort of autumn this year, or if we do release them in the summer, We've still got this year where the impact that they'll have won't be big enough to to have a massive impact on our baseline. Um, so it kind of popped up quite quickly, and then with with lockdown, it meant we couldn't actually go out and do a lot of stuff. Um, so we could have had a whole summer to prepare this year because we weren't really allowed to be doing stuff, and we had to put it on side. So I'd like a lot more data. Um, we've got a lot of groups that are going to survey for us, so we'll be generating that, and we'll be doing a five year study at least five year study to measure the impacts year on year. And so you can really map the changes. Yeah. And that is something that uh, George and I are working on um, kind of together as well, is, is looking at the training for volunteers in order to do the surveys and, and uh, putting on opportunities for that as well. Lovely. Right. Probably just a couple more. Um, George, do you want to pick a couple of questions just to finish off? If there's any that, that are really standing out that you think haven't you haven't covered yet? So quickly, and then we'll have to finish up, I think. So quickly run through them as quick as I can. So Dave Shaw sounds like there's a network of landowners in the country queuing up to have beavers. So there is lots and lots of releases in the UK at the moment. Um, there's loads going on under the radar, which people don't know about. Private landowners, there's, people want them. It's weird. <laughs> it's not weird, it's cool. But people you don't think would want them, want them. So there's lots of people that do want them. Um, and that links into, oh, it's coming up. Yeah, so that's that's that one. Um, I'll just be as quick as I can for everyone. Yeah. Um, chance to see beavers in Staffordshire one day. Staffordshire Wildlife Trust, I'm sure they'd love to get them in there. Um, there's no reason they wouldn't do. And with us doing our projects, we're here to help out and go through it with them. I'm sure they're already planning one. So yeah. I'm sure there's talk. Somewhere. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, I don't see why they wouldn't be. Um, dog walkers on reserve, affecting the wildlife. And the way we're making our path down the actual track, we're going to kick them off down the end of our track currently onto another bit of land away from the reserve. So it means they won't be able to get onto the reserve or get anywhere near where the birds are. So that's how we're getting around the, the, um, the issue with the dogs on, on, on the reserve. Um, camera traps on the badger gates. Yep, we will we'll be. We'll be monitoring that quite readily. Um, our amazing team of camera trappers are out all the time, setting them up because we're allowed to, because it's funded work, so they're allowed to do that. Um, so they'll be helping out with that one. Um, Sight and Trent project area. What do you reckon? Trent Possibly project one area. for me, that one, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Any other site in the Trent project area that might be considered for future beaver releases? Not as part of the Triple TV scheme, the Transform and the Trent Valley scheme, um, but it might be that in, in the few years that we've got left that we do identify a site that could be uh, useful, uh, uh, suitable, sorry, for them. Um, but as cur currently, no, but uh, maybe in the future, who knows? Uh, type of fencing, what sort of area enclosed. So it's going to be just under 47 hectares. Um, I reckon it's going to be more about the 40 hectare mark. Because we're not doing right to the edge of the reserve. And the fencing is very high. It's it's mesh fencing. Um, I can't remember the mill of it now, but it's 
it's more enough for mammals to get through, small mammals, but not big enough that things can get out. And it also allows the passage of debris through it when it floods. Um, that's been agreed with the environment agency. Um, so we have buried into the ground, across the ground as well, so two lots of mesh, and then an overhang on certain areas, which is very high, high strength. Uh, should I carry on quickly? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it goes right. Yeah, we've got five, we can get through them. Oh, we? yeah, we can do that. Yeah. So any other introduction sites in the county when BBs need to be from Wellington? Um, we want to make sure this one goes, goes well, uh, make sure it's, uh, we've got the project reports written up so we know what we've done, how we've done it. And then we could look to do other sites in Derbyshire, definitely. Um, we'd like to go higher up. Um, there's other reserves where, like Hilton, for instance, people wouldn't have thought Hilton as a beaver reserve because there's not much running. There's running water, but not a lot. But Hilton is perfect. It is a perfect site for beavers. They can be in the ponds and felling the trees on the edges, creating more diversity. Um, but we have got a team that's going to be looking into other reintroduction sites for Derbyshire. And we'll hopefully be developing a reintroductions team as well to to get on with that and that, that might be us in our spare time helping as volunteers if we can't get the funding because i'd love to do more stuff like this uh no gps tagging um, it's been spoken about but you have to put them in the tail i think um but the tail isn't just a load of cells and a load of mass there is actually nerves and stuff in there um and that's the only real place you put gps tag as far as i'm aware um and they will rip them out they, they will rip them out and then that leads some infections so and that, there's probably small stuff that I've never heard of or seen, but when I spoke to Derek about it, they haven't really bothered with GPS tracking. Um, but it would be great. It would be cool to do. So we know exactly where they are. Help you out, certainly. Yeah. Uh, we've got downstream hydro hydrological monitoring. So we're going to be doing uh, river fly monitoring. We're going to have sensor. We're hopefully we're going to get a sensing unit to go in the front start and at the end of the reserve so we can monitor the flow in and flow out, the nutrient levels, the pH and all that sort of thing. Um, if you know anyone who wants to help out that season, you're all welcome to. Um, but yeah, we will be looking at monitoring all of that sort of, um, all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Two more to go. Let's go. Cool. So central study body for the UK introductions. I don't actually know. I know there's a lot of universities that are doing their own individual research. Um, and there is, oh no, I do know. Um, we're out in Britain. Um, so we're out in Britain is working on monitoring um, for UK introduction and rewilding. So that's a good place to look at. And there's a company called Ecos2, Ecos, Ecosulis. Um, so Eco, S-U-L-I-S, who are quite keen on working on stuff like this. Um, yeah, off the top of my head, that's, that's what I'm aware of. Brilliant. And then the final question, I think, is a really good final question to end on. Uh, where can we keep up updated with the project and follow progress? So yeah. what, what I'll say first is um, tomorrow I'll be sending out a follow up email to this um, with a, a brief feedback form for you to fill in to tell us how you found the talk. But I can include information from George about uh, links to where you can follow the project uh, there as well. But um, I'll send that tomorrow. But George, if there's any anywhere else that people can keep up to date. Yeah, so we are... Again, we've got some really cool volunteers that are doing a series of vlogs for us. Um, so we're doing a different theme every couple of weeks, if we can get the footage, um, which they are doing very well. Um, and the only unfortunate thing is I'm doing the talking and I'm not very good at talking. Uh, so we're doing that. Um, so keep your eye out for them. That's on our DWT YouTube channel, um, but we'll also share it on our social media. Our uh, Twitter, Instagram and uh, Facebook are always posting updates on the project. We have gone quite quite recently because of everything that's going on and the uncertainty of what's happening. Um, but we will be starting to ramp up what we're saying again. So there'll be a lot more information coming out. So yeah, the best thing to do, check out our social media page, click on our website and look on our YouTube. Um, we should have plenty of things coming out. Wonderful, right. Thank you very much. We have gone slightly over time, but I think that was really brilliant of George to, to stay on and answer all of those questions. So. Just to say thank you very much to everyone who has stuck around this long to listen to us. Thank you to everyone for joining the talk. Uh, it has been recorded, so we'll be putting that recording up um, on, I presume, on the YouTube pages for Derbyshire Wildlife Trust and for Transforming the Trent Valley as well. 
Um, and as, as I said, I'll send out a follow up email tomorrow just with a very, very brief feedback form four multiple choice questions just to get your feedback on how you found this evening. Um, I think it's been wonderful. I think it's been a really interesting evening. Thank you so much to George for taking the time to come and speak to us about the project. It's been really, really interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a lovely evening and we hope to see you at a future talk soon.